Wonderful to see everyone here this morning. We're going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper afterwards, so be preparing yourselves for that. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 20. Do have, your, do have a Bible out in front of you if you can. Uh, a couple of the uh, commentaries, authors, preachers, I've... Uh, been studying and reading as I'm going through this, say several of these phrases are cumbersome. So it'll be helpful for you to have a Bible in front of you as we're looking at it uh, and make our way through it. 2 Corinthians 1, 12 through 20. You may think that's an odd place to end. I wanted to end at 22, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to go into 21 and 22 after I got done with 18, 19, and 20. <laughs> so next week we'll have a part two. First, our Second Corinthians chapter one, starting at verse twelve. For our boast is this: the testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. For we are not writing to you anything other than what you read and acknowledge, and I hope you will fully acknowledge just as you did partially acknowledge us, that on the day of our Lord Jesus you will boast of us as we will boast of you. Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Sylvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in Him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our Amen to God for His glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that in these letters in the Bible we so often find Paul and others making one point and in the process laying out spiritual truth that is such a blessing, that almost seems secondary to their purpose. We thank you, Father, that uh, we have him defending himself here against people who were accusing him falsely about his travel plans. But, Father, we thank you most of all for what we learn about Christ and about you in this passage. That all the promises that you've made throughout Scripture find their yes, find their fulfillment in Christ. Now they are sure, they are true, and they can be depended upon. Father, I pray that each one of us, as we uh, look at this passage, you will speak to our hearts. Not only that we are to be people of our word, that we are to be true, and we are to, be, we are to fulfill the things that we say we're going to do, but that... More than anything, Father, we see this is true of You. That all these wonderful promises that we find throughout Scripture, we've seen them over the years of, of history being fulfilled, each and every one of them. And we know there are many, many more promises yet to be fulfilled. Father, I pray that You help us to, to see that You are faithful, that You are true. Help us to look forward to the coming of Christ, the second coming, so, so often prophesied and spoken of in Scripture. We've seen Him come once. We've seen everything happen exactly to Your Word. Help us to lean on these truths and to live according to these truths. Guide us as we, as we look through this passage, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in the city of Hebron, in Israel, there is an archaeological site that doesn't get much tourism. It should. First excavated back in the 1920s, 
And since then, the city of Hebron has sprawled surrounding it, has grown and, and has grown around it, practically swallowing it up. Now, that archaeological site is basically an empty lot with uh, several ancient foundations uh, around it and within it. Nothing seeming more than four or five feet tall. Skyscrapers all around it. Curiously, what I, find, what I find really interesting, there are several holes in the bedrock. If you can see this, a portion of this archaeological site or this empty lot is bedrock. And there are holes, a couple holes in this. And archaeologists tell us that's where ancient trees grew through the bedrock. This is where, in Genesis 13, we are told Abraham showed up at this spot and pitched his tent by the oaks of Mamre. As Genesis says, the great trees. So these holes uh, in the bedrock with grass growing up through them were left by the, the trees that were there when Abraham pitched his tent. There's one picture I found on the internet. One lady, uh, Joel Kramer, uh, writes about this in his book, uh, Where God Came Down. Uh, a lady is sitting down right at the edge of that hole, leaning back on the imaginary tree that uh, Abraham would have leaned up against. The site has been, and this is interesting, commemorated from the earliest of days. There is a, a well just yards away from those, those holes in the ground still being used today, a well that, the well that Abraham would have used so that would have drawn him to that spot. And what's unique and, and, and interesting about this is how several different groups of people uh, down through history have uh, added to its walls, added to its structure in order to keep the memory of the place alive. Go through them real quick. First, there is the altar that Abraham built there. Uh, this, is, this is the place, remember, where, where God came and spoke to Abraham, where the three angels or the three men, but one of them being called the Lord, right, came and made the promises to Abraham. There is pottery there for that time period, the Bronze, the bronze Age, showing that Abraham, uh, it was active during his time. Second, years later in David's time, uh, 1000 to 586 B.C., two large square structures, a, a gate structure, showed that an enclosure had been added around this site in order to, again, preserve the spot. Again, age uh, pottery showing that it was used during that time. Third, Herod gets into the act, and he takes his large blocks that he was known for and again and sets up a structure around it to help identify the focus of that spot. Abraham's altar is right in the middle of, of Abraham's or of uh, Herod's massive walls. Kramer writes this, it was the centerpiece, the, the altar. Surrounded by massive walls, Herod only built up three sites in order to please his Jewish subjects. The fact that one of them was Mamre demonstrates its significance as an important Jewish holy site. And then some 300 years later, Constantine, the first Roman emperor who claimed Christianity as his faith, adds to the, the contribution, his contribution. Um, his mother-in-law, Eutropia, was on pilgrimage going to the Holy Land. She stopped by there to, to see that site, and she noticed that the pagans were using it to offer sacrifices. And so she wrote to Constantine, her son-in-law, and said, do something about this. So what did he do? He went and built a church at the site. Eusebius records this for us. Again, Joel Kramer writes this, Constantine built a church there on the site. He only commissioned four churches in the Holy Land, the Church of the Nativity, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Eliona Church, which is the Church of the Ascension, and the Church at Mamre. And this is the best, the best preserved of all of those. The fifth layer found at the site is the Islamic period, seven centuries. Uh, 7th seven, seven century A.D. Kramer writes this, Since Abraham is venerated in Islam, the Muslims continued to commemorate the campsite at Mamre. Their recognition of Mamre as a sacred site explains why the, Pal the Palestinian city of Hebron in the West Bank grew and expanded around Mamre rather than over the top of it. Now why, you may ask, are you starting with this, Troy? <laughs> as we're looking at this passage in 2 Corinthians. Joel Kramer, in his book, where God Came Down talks about several different archaeological sites where, where God uh, visited, or Christ visited. And he starts off his book, chapter 1, with this place, so often ignored. And he titles it, The Place of Promises. Chapter 1, 
the place of promises. This is the place, Mamre, where the three men came, one of them being the Lord, and Eusebius and, and Justin Martyr and several people saying that it was a Christophany, it was Christ who came, who spoke to Abraham. This is the place where he came and said, you and your wife will have a son in your old age, and that son will be, become a mighty nation, and he will bless all the nations of the world. This is the place where the promises, where the promises first came to Abraham. Through this people, think about this, Christ the Messiah came to earth, and as Joel Kramer puts it, he says, Herod tried to kill this child, while at the same time he was unknowingly building walls around the very place where this child had been promised. This child, Jesus, did come as promised. He lived and died and then rose again to rescue mankind from sin, establishing a new covenant between God and man. Now people from all nations, not just Israel, had a way to be in a righteous relationship with God. So this was the place where the promises were made. Look again at verse 20. This is the passage that stopped me, and I thought, I can't go beyond this. I want to stop with this, because we are at a mountain peak in verse 20, a famous and a much-loved verse. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. Every single promise will be fulfilled. Every single promise has been fulfilled in Christ, through Christ. So neat to, to picture that ancient site, that, that memory, that archaeological site, 4,000 years old. Think about that. Preserved to this day. Swallowed up by the, the millennia of, of uh, the thousands of years of, of progress. Now skyscrapers over it. And what did we see happen in that time period? The Messiah came, just as promised. He died. He, he was risen from the dead. He did exactly as the promises said He would do. And now, here we are. And there's more promises to come, aren't there? More promises in the, in, in the Bible speaking about His second coming than His first. So I, I see this, this passage. It's, it's interesting. Uh, it's autobiographical so much. Paul is here defending himself. And in, in defending himself, he makes a statement about Christ, which is one that we can really hang on, one that we can really lean on. So as we saw, let's go back and look at it, because we also want to understand what Paul is talking about here. We don't want to just focus on that, and, and, and as wonderful it is, as it is, but we want to understand Paul's argument. What's he doing? What's he saying here? So... If you remember, last week and two weeks ago, we saw that 2 Corinthians, as I said, is very autobiographical in nature. Paul speaks about Jesus Christ here in 18, 19, and 20 to make a point about himself. And we'll see what that is. We'll look at it a little more carefully in a little bit. But last week, remember that Paul spoke about suffering and how God uses suffering in the Christian's life. And now coming right on the heels of that, he transitions into a defense Defending himself against accusations. See the heading there in your Bible? Mine, mine has Paul, Paul's change of plans. Most translations have a, a heading there at verse 12. Paul made a change in his travel itinerary, and it was used probably by the, the Judaizers and those who were against him to tarnish his image. You can imagine them casually saying that Paul is not a man of his word. Paul can't be trusted. Paul makes promises and then he breaks promises. He's, he's just like everyone else, right? He can't be trusted. So Paul responds here. In verses 12 through 14, he, he, his, he says, My conscience bears testimony. In verses 15 through 17, he, he explains his original travel plans. And then in verses 18 through 20, he brings other witnesses to vouch for his integrity. So Paul's on trial. He's defending himself, and remember, primarily because the gospel is at stake. If this would have just been some, some accusation, something against him, calling him names or whatever, he could have just took the blow and, and went on and, and ignored it, right? 
But the gospel is at stake. If he lets this go, the people who are accusing him of this have a, have a foothold with the people they're trying to deceive. And so he has to make a point. He has to defend himself. So look at his conscience testifying for him in verses 12 through 14. Again, the verses say, For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. For we're not writing you, to you anything other than what you read and acknowledge, and I hope you will fully acknowledge, just as you did partially acknowledge us, that on the day of our Lord Jesus you will boast of us as we will boast of you. So Paul says here, I claim one thing with confidence. One thing he says he's proud of. The Phillips translation has at the beginning of verse 12, Now it is a matter of pride to us. <laughs> this is our boast. My conscience is clear. The NIV says it clearly. Our conscience testifies that we've conducted ourselves, and especially in our relationship with you in the holiness and sincerity that are from God. Isn't it nice... <laughs> to put it lightly, when your conscience bears witness for you and not against you. When you're accused of something and you can honestly say, I really didn't mean to do that. I really am innocent of these charges. It may look bad. I may have made a mistake. But my conscience is bearing witness for me. Paul's saying, I meant no harm. I wasn't being fickle. I wasn't just changing plans willy-nilly. He did change plans. But for a good reason, we'll see. It seems I've, I've mentioned our conscience several times now. I, a couple weeks ago, and at camp, I also brought it up again a couple times. What a blessing we have in our conscience. We need, we need, to, listen, we need to listen carefully to that inner voice that convicts us or acquits us. It either... It either justifies us or it condemns us. But we also need to be very careful. Our conscience alone cannot be trusted. It is not the gold standard. It, is, it needs to be informed by God's Word. It needs to, be, to align with God's Word in order for it to really act accurately, correctly in our life. Mark DeHaan tells the story of buying a, a brand new car, driving it down the road, seeing a policeman pull out behind him and driving for several blocks and then finally pulling him over. And Mark Dahan talked to the policeman. He said, I, I saw you behind me. I'm no fool. He said, I was doing 25. And the policeman said, no, you were doing 32. And they talked about it for a while. And he said, well, this is a brand new car. So they actually did a little test. And he went around and they, it, the policeman got him with the radar. And he said, no, your speedometer is off by, by seven miles per hour. <laughs> See, our, our conscience is like that speedometer. It, it has to be adjusted to something that is solid, something that is true. Otherwise, if we're just going by our conscience and never informing it with God's Word, with truth, we might sear our conscience, right? And we, might, we might be living according to something that's not accurate. The more time we spend in God's Word, the more informed we are the more accurate our conscience is. Paul says, My conscience testifies that I have ministered with simplicity. If you notice, if you're looking at the NIV, he uses the word holiness, which would be a separation from, from the world's corruption. And it works here, right? He, he could say that I have ministered among you, not in a corrupt way like the world, but in a, in a way that aligns with God's holiness. But... That's different. Simplicity or holiness, the, the difference there is a manuscript difference. If you look at the two, the two Greek words, there is very little difference between them. And it's two lines that come down together that could be easily ignored. So there, there's a, a copyist made a mistake somewhere along the line. And um, so now we have a variant there, holiness. Both words, as I say, make, make sense. But simplicity seems to make more sense. Because the argument that Paul's making here is that he spoke openly and clearly. He, he, his, his written words were not double talk. Uh, they weren't ambiguous. And he's going to use the word simplicity four more times uh, in, in this letter. And in fact, he's accused by the, by the Judaizers of being simple. <laughs> in a way that they, they're not impressed with, right? He, he writes in a simple manner. 
But that's what Paul's saying. My ministry was marked by simplicity and godly sincerity, marked by the absence of deceit and hypocrisy. And look at the way verse 12 works. It's, it's really interesting. He goes on to say, it's not been marked by earthly wisdom, like deceitfulness and trickery and worldly arrogance, those things that the Corinthians were, were impressed with. He says, but by the grace of God, his behavior, his ministry was marked by just the opposite. Simplicity and godly sincerity. So look at what he's doing there. His boasting, his, his confidence is not in himself. His boasting is in the grace of God and how it is working itself out in his life. His boasting there is in God. You and I have nothing to boast about on our own, do we? We look at the things that happen in our life, the, the, the things that that come out of the things we put effort into and we see God working in our life and honestly we need to sit back and say God is the one who's doing this. And that's what Paul's doing here. So many times our motives can be not what they should be. And when we look at this passage we see, we see a man who's saying before God I stand before you I've, I've lived the life God wants me to live in His power. And how many times can we, can we say that our motives line up with that? In your ministry, in your vocation, in your, in your service in the world, in, in your family, in the things that, that you do, can you say this? Can you say, you know what? I've been very clear about what I've said and done, and I've, and I've done it in godly sincerity in my ministry. And, and that's ministry, vocation, all of it. You know, you don't have to be a minister to have a ministry, right? We have a ministry wherever we are. Paul is, Paul is saying his conscience bears witness. I like the way he says, and supremely so toward you, or and abundantly so toward you. This was a church with a lot of problems, right? And Paul says, you know what? I was very careful when I came, came to you guys because I knew there were a lot of problems. And so abundantly so, I made sure my motives were clear. Didn't take money from them. Several, several things he was very, very careful about. Look at verses 13 and 14 with me. I think this is kind of funny. Paul is here making the point that he has been clear in his letters. And he's not very clear in making that point, if you ask me. <laughs> Verses 13 and 14 are, are confusing. It's, it's kind of, uh, this, is, this is one of those places where uh, several authors said his words are cumbersome. They're, they're kind of confusing here. And it's funny because he's making the point that he's been clear, right? Uh, verses 13 and 14. For we are not writing to you anything other than what you read and acknowledge... And I hope you will fully acknowledge, just as you did partially acknowledge us, that on the day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast of us as we will boast of you. The Phillips has it this way, and the Phillips translation helps. Our letters to you have no double meaning. They mean just what you understand them to mean when you read them. I hope you will always understand these letters, just as I believe that you have partially understood me, so that you will come to realize that you can be as honestly proud of us as we are of you on the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul's written some things. They've been misconstrued. They've been used by the enemy to really cause division. And Paul's saying, you can go back and you can look at the things that I've written. And you're going to see that, that I've been clear in everything that I've said. And, and 13 and 14, what it does is it amplifies verse 12. His ministry was marked by simplicity and godly sincerity. He went to great efforts to make his teaching clear and plain. Now, not all of Paul's teaching is clear and plain, is it? Peter even says that, right? But evidently, he made a special effort with the Corinthians. Now, there are two other letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and we don't have copies of those. They were not canonical, so we don't have them in the Bible, and we'll deal with them a little bit later. But what he's saying here is he's hoping, he's hoping, he's praying that this letter and a careful reading of the letters that they have received from him will clear up the misconceptions. If you look at it carefully, Paul says, and stop listening to the Judaizers. He says, so, so our relationship is restored so that on the day when Christ Jesus comes again, you and I can stand side by side and, and boast of one another. 
Look at them. Look at how they've lived their life. And look at him. Look at how he led us to Christ. He longs to restore and to reestablish a, a mutual sense of pride in, in one another. So he starts off here by explaining his travel plans. And look at verses 15 and 16. Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. I, I like the Phillips, I think it said, to give you a double treat. <laughs> I wanted to, wanted to give you two visits. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. By the way, send me on my way is Paul's, is their way of saying, I want you to help me financially uh, with protection, with anything I may need. I want you to do that. So, so there he is explaining his, his travel plans. Um, Phillips, again, I love the, the heading over that. Change of plan does not necessarily mean fickleness of heart. <laughs> it's the point Paul's trying to make. And we, we don't need to get into the details of the itinerary. As I said, when I began working on this, I was planning on going to 21 and 22, and I thought there's too much here to spend a lot of time just talking about his, his itinerary. But just notice that he had to change his plans. And, and look down, we'll, we'll look at it, Lord willing, next week. Look at verse 23. He explains why. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. I love David Gusick on this. He says, if I would have come, I would have ripped your arm off of you and beat you over the head with it. And he said, and it was to spare you that kind of ugliness that I didn't come. <laughs> So Paul's saying, if I would have come, it would have been very difficult. And through much prayer and through much thought and, and really working on this in godly sincerity, I thought it might be smart to stay away for a little while. That's what Paul's saying here. A sequence of events, not just those, but, but those led up to his change of plans. Every time I sat down and studied this and, and thought about this, I pictured in my mind, I heard in my mind, children throughout my life, my adult life, saying to me, but you promised. I think of Michael. Uh, he, was, he was good at this. He would, uh, Michael uh, from Spofford, uh, one of the foster kids that we did a lot with, he would somehow get you after a while to say, okay, maybe. And then in the next few minutes it was, but you promised that we would do this. And I'm guilty of this, but I, I have, I have, I mean, I say it to my shame. I was embarrassed when you have daughters that are here, you know, they, they remember things that you promised and it was a big deal to them, but you know, things came up and, and we had to, we had to change plans, right? We need to be careful. As I'm, as I'm looking at this, it was, a, it was a change in plans that Paul made that gave the enemy a, a foot in the door. It was, it was a change in plans that, that caused the Corinthians to doubt his sincerity. And we need to be careful. A child or other people, adults, can fix on something that you've said you would do and it doesn't take top priority, priority in our lives. And sometimes we can change those plans kind of willy-nilly because we don't feel like it. And that's not what Paul did. Think about this. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Right? Just a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. At the time, he was saying, don't throw an, an oath. Don't tag an oath onto everything you say. If you do, there's, there's a problem there, okay? Just, just be a person of your word. Do what you say, right? Keep your promises. And you can just hear the, the super apostles. He calls them back here in, in chapter, chapter 11 or 12. You can hear the, the Judaizers saying, you know, Jesus himself said that we're to be men of our word. And Paul, Paul's just not, he's not. He's not sincere. Jesus said, let your yes be yes. And, and Paul, he's not, a, he's not a promise keeper, is he? Remember, they did everything they could to bring Paul down in the people's eyes so they could slip in their false teaching, Satan behind it. And Paul defends himself. Look, look, look at verse 17. He says, was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no, at the same time? 
Now think about it. Here we are again, listening in on one side of a phone conversation. We don't know exactly what's been told to Paul, what's been said to him. They've evidently accused him, we, can, we know this, of being unreliable, of being a, a promise breaker, of being uh, someone you can't trust what he says, someone who says one thing and then does another. Now, look, I'm not... I'm not spending a lot of time on this for no reason. There's, there's good reason to think about this idea that they are accusing him of being someone you cannot trust. Because look at it. We actually have in verses 18, 19, and 20, we have this yes and no come up again several times. It dominates. Verses 18, 19, and 20. So what they've done here is they've accused him of being at odds with Christ. You're not representing Christ accurately. You're, you're, you're not a good representative of Christ. Christ was all about truth. He was truth personified, right? And here you are, Paul. You can't be trusted at all. Look at verse 17. They accused him of vacillating, of wavering of being fickle. The Phillips says, Do you think I plan with my tongue in my cheek, saying yes and no to suit my own wishes? Do I make my plans like a worldly man, he says? Paul says, You know me. I have character. I have the track record with you. You know who I am. Think about that for a second. I kept going from the great truths about Jesus Christ and, and the truths just that we have to deal with on a, on a daily basis. Paul was not like so many people out there, me at times and probably you at times, who say, well, I know I said I would do it, but you know, I just, I had to sleep in. I needed, to, I needed some me time. I had to think about myself. I had to focus on myself. I, you know, I, I had to break the plans because I, I need to care for myself, right? He wasn't that kind of person. His plans didn't change according to selfish whims. He was a man of his word. He was trustworthy. He could be trusted. But sometimes plans change, don't they? Honestly, they do. But he could honestly say, and, and this is what, what gets me. <laughs> this is what convicts me. My conscience convicts me. He could honestly say that in his travel plans, he had sought God's will on the matter. He'd handled it all, it all very carefully, with godly sincerity, with prayer. He had their good in mind regarding these travel plans. It wasn't just because he didn't feel like it. I, I wrote down, can we say that? <laughs> can I say that? That we order our day, we order our ministry, we order our, our service prayerfully, thoughtfully, selflessly. We're people of our word. Can we be trusted? Paul, Paul, Paul is on, on, the, on the, what do you call it? He's being, he's in court. He's on the stand. And he's being accused. And he can honestly say, this is the way I've dealt with you guys. That's impressive. Look at what he does. He brings other witnesses to vouch for his integrity. Look at verse, verses 18, 19, and the beginning of 20. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in Him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. Went ahead and read all of 20. So he responds to these, look at it there on the page. He responds to these charges with an oath. The, the, today's English version says, As God is true, my promise to you was not a yes and a no. <laughs> So he authenticates as, as powerfully as he, as he can, as strongly as he can, his actions. And then look at this. He makes an argument, very common in the day, and we, we probably do it too, from the greater to the lesser. He says, my preaching about Jesus Christ and the gospel, the good news of salvation through Christ, has been truthful and accurate and not at all wavering. In this great big area, I've been faithful. 
Now, do you think in something as minor as travel plans, I'm going to be unfaithful? Would I not be faithful and truthful and maintain my integrity in a small matter like this? Warren Wiersbe put it this way, The Corinthians were saved because Paul and his friends preached Jesus Christ to them. How could God reveal truth through false instruments? And there's great matter I've been faithful in. Don't you think I am in the small? Jesus is the theme. And we could look at that and pull that verse out alone and preach on that. Jesus is the theme of all Christian preaching. He is the embodiment of truth. There is no yes and no with Jesus. No wavering, no fickleness, no selfishly not following through in Jesus, right? Look at the end of verse 19. It says, but in Him it is always yes. His promises are always kept. He is a man of His word, right? Jesus is. God in the flesh cannot lie. The Phillips says He is the divine yes. Now, now Paul knows that this is all a little fuzzy. It's all a little enigmatic, a little, a little puzzling, the way he's saying it, using the words yes and no. But remember, he's probably pulling that from their conversation to him, saying the Judaizers are saying, you're, you're, you're wavering. Your yes doesn't mean yes, it means no, and, and, we can, and you can't be trusted. So it's all a little fuzzy. So he clears it up in verse 20. Look at verse 20. That's where he says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. Every promise of God finds its affirmative in Him. Every promise that God has made to us is fulfilled and will be fulfilled because of Christ, right? If it wasn't for Him, if it wasn't for His life, His, His coming to the earth and representing us and dying in our place, we would still be under the wrath of God. All the promises, not for us, right? But because of Christ, they are. How many promises, just think about this, how many promises in Scripture are you relying upon that God has given you? How many of them do you think about and you think, that's true? Jesus came to earth, we read, and He walked a perfect life in perfect obedience to God. And that righteous life has been imputed to you, given to you. Is God backing out on His Word? Is God saying, well, I didn't really mean that? No, God cannot lie. Think about the promises. Jesus paid your sin debt at the cross. Your sins are removed. They are as far as the east is from the west when you place your faith in Him. Is that true? Is, is, is God up there saying, it's a good idea at the time, but I've changed my mind since then. But one this morning, we, we're looking at Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord, who are called according to His purpose. Is that true? Can we really say, this horrible thing that's happened to me is going to work for good? That's a promise. It's a promise that's fulfilled because of Christ. For, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Are those words reliable? Yes. Yes. We see in the text so many times. Amen. Right? In Christ. In Christ, those words are true. Look at, look at the last part of verse 20. It says, that is why it is through Him that we utter our Amen to God for His glory. What a thought. All the promises of God are yours. If you believe, if you trust, if you place your faith in Christ, if you truly trust Christ, another promise in Scripture is the Holy Spirit will begin to work in your life. And over time, you'll be able to see a big difference in your life. That's a promise. One that's true because of Jesus Christ. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Another promise. The promises of God will be fulfilled. 
have been and will be fulfilled. Every last one. Donald Gray Barnhouse was mentioned this morning in the video we watched. I read a story about him going to a hotel in Ohio where he knew the bellhop, the porter who carried his bags up to the room. He had been there several times at the hotel. On the way up to, their, to his room, uh, they had a conversation about the promises of God and Barnhouse asked him to make an illustration to teach him something. How much money do you have in your pocket? And the porter said, I have a dollar 19. And in the 30s or 40s, whenever this happened, that was a lot of money. I looked it up. It would be almost, almost 20 bucks uh, buying power. He had that money on a Tuesday. That's all he had. And it had to last him until Friday. Um, buy you several meals. Uh, Barnhouse took out a 50 cent piece. Doesn't sound like a big tip today, but it was a big tip back then. Handed it to him. And he said, how much do you have now? And the porter said, $1.69, if my math's right, if my memory's right, $1.69. And then Barnhouse took the 50 cent piece and put it back in his pocket. And he goes, how much do you have now? The porter, sad look on his face, said, $1.19. He said, am I a liar? Barnhouse said, am I a liar? Did I not tell you that I would give you that 50 cent piece? He said, how much do you have? And the porter said, I have $1.69 and 50 cents of my money is in your pocket. <laughs> That's how we need to look at the promises, the promises of God. He's made promises to us. Some of them haven't been fulfilled, but they're ours. And they are sure. Of course, he gave him the 50 cent piece. <laughs> the promises of God, even those not yet realized, are ours. I don't know why, maybe my mind's a little weird, but I keep going back to that archaeological site, the Oaks of Mamre in Hebron. 4,000 years that site has been there. Those stones have been there. Think about the technology. Think about the differences. If you could do a time lapse of 4,000 years, the city spreading out, the city rising up, airplanes flying over, now drones flying over. That's in the West Bank. This is one of the most the most hot places in, in the Middle East right now. In fact, when he was, uh, Joel Kramer, doing a video there, there were several uh, Palestinian youths around him really disturbing the whole, the whole shot. Oh, they're screaming and yelling, and they're, they're videoing him as he's talking. But just think about how things have changed over time. Drones flying overhead now, and missiles, and, and all of that. And those stones have been there. I, so many times biblical archaeologists talk about we didn't really start digging until the 1800s. We didn't start, the, the science of archaeology didn't start. And they're like, so many times I have read that God has allowed in these last days for these sites to be uncovered to give credence to, give proof to God's Word. I look at that and I think, it's amazing. All that time, the Messiah promised. He came, He lived, He died, He rose, He ascended. He's promised to come again. Is that a promise that you can say is for me? His coming is for me. Let's pray. Father, I pray for each one of us here that we understand what's at stake. Your promises down through history proven themselves over and over and over again. So many cities having their futures foretold and then happening exactly as you, as you prophesied through the prophets. Help us to understand, Father, that your word is true. And that there's going to come a day that's going to be unexplainable by most when Christ will return. Help us to be ready. Help us, first of all, Father, to be yours, to place our faith in you, to be born from above. Help us not to put that off, not to neglect that. Help us to understand the importance of that. Help us also to understand the importance as you're, as you're, of your, being your children, that we're to be ready, that we're not to be living as the world lives. We're, we're, we're to be living in godly sincerity, carefully living our lives, waiting for you. Pray, Father, that you'll press that on our hearts. Help us to, to live our lives for you as if we really believe you're coming back. Because we do. 
We thank you, Father, for your love for us. Thank you for what we've spoken about, Christ coming and dying in our place. And I pray, Father, that you'll prepare our hearts, help this Lord's Supper to be a precious time that we have with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.